Good morning. Uh, I would like to talk this morning about uh, pathological observations in uh, patients that had transverse myelitis. Uh, this is a, really a, a little bit difficult point many times when we lost patients and we ask the patients or the family that if they allow us to evaluate uh, uh, the spinal core or the nervous system after a patient die. Um, it's a very difficult point because uh, there are a lot of uh, uh, family members that probably are not going to like the idea of uh, doing an autopsy or pathological study. Pathological studies are very important and are important because are going to teach us about what happened and about what was the disease and also is uh, going to teach us about mechanism of disease. Transverse myelitis is a very rare disease and there are not too many studies about transverse myelitis. And what uh, I want to s send you a message is many times when your doctor approached you and asked you that if you will be able or you will be willing to uh, donate your brain or your spinal cord in the future for research, think about. And this is a very difficult point early this morning. But <laughs> remember, we have learned about all of the diseases just using pathological studies. And to introduce the topic of pathological studies, I want to show you um, image about the anatomical organization of the spinal cord. And this is a beautiful drawing. It was done more than 100 years ago by a Spanish uh, uh, scientist who was called Santiago Ramón y Cajal. He spent a lot of time studying the histology of the nervous system, not, not only in humans, but also in animals. And he basically was the person, the first person who showed us how is the structure of the nervous system. And he did a beautiful drawing, drawings about what is the anatomy of the spinal cord. And you remember very well because you have spent a lot of time evaluating the spinal cord and studying about transverse myelitis. And you know very well that the spinal cord is a very important organ in the body because it's the connection between the brain the brainstem and several other structures in the, in the human body. It's part of the sensory system, it's taking the information from a sensory receptor, it's taking information to the muscle, so it's a major uh, organ in, in the nervous system. For that reason, we need to know a little bit about the anatomy. Uh, this is also another drawing. It's an original uh, uh, hand drawing by Cajal, and he put colors to this drawing. And what he basically point out uh, uh, beautifully is that the spinal cord is highly organized, has different areas that correspond to uh, different functions. So if you remember, we have the uh, gray matter portion of the uh, uh, spinal cord, and that gray matter have two major areas, the area of anterior horn that contains many of the motor neurons and the area of the dorsal horns that contain many of the sensory neurons. So this um, anatomy is very important because we know that transverse myelitis can affect the spinal cord either in a focal areas or in the entire spinal cord. If we have transverse myelitis affecting only one portion of the spinal cord, obviously that will determine what type of clinical problems you are going to have. So it's very important that you have the image about the anatomical uh, um, uh, uh, topography of the spinal cord. Now, it's very well known also after uh, Cajal that all of these areas outside of the gray matter are part of what we call the white matter tracks. Those are the tracks, those are the connections that are going up and down. And those connections are basically a, a, a accumulation of fibers that are coming from the peripheral nerves or are coming from the brain. And those uh, uh, structures are uh, very important for the central nervous system function.
There are different type of cells in the spinal cord, and let's do a very quick review. Probably the most important part is what is dealing with neurons. The neurons are basically two types of neurons, sensory neurons and motor neurons. But the motor neurons are very characteristic in the spinal cord. Are, they are very characteristic because they are very large, and they contain very large fibers that we call axons. And those axons contain a substance that is wrapping the fiber, and we call that substance myelin. And you, ha you heard yesterday about demyelination, and what I want to tell you today is that many of the motor neurons contain fibers that are myelinated, and losing myelin doesn't mean that you are going to lose the neuron. Losing the fiber and losing the cell body is obviously uh, a more uh, difficult situation because that means that the neuron is dying or, is, or, or, you are, or, or, or basically there is a cell dead there. In addition to the neurons, there are other group of cells, cells that help the nervous system to work. We have astrocytes, we have microglia, we have ependyma. I forgot to put here the oligodendroglial cells. The oligodendroglial cells are quite important because are small cells that produce the myelin. So everything related with myelin is related with oligodendroglial cells. The astrocytes and microglia have other roles, maintaining the homeostasis of the spinal cord, and the other important function is that they are participating in the immunological reactions, the inflammation of the spinal cord. For that reason, it's very important to you, uh, uh, remember this cell because we, we will show later how these cells are participating in the injury that occurs in uh, transfer myelitis. Obviously, we need to have a blood supply for the spinal cord, and that blood supply is uh, maintained by the uh, blood vessels that contain endothelial cells that are basically the cells that are forming the uh, blood vessels and contain other cells that may include perivascular macrophages that are cells that are uh, uh, immune cells that participate in the screening of a potential uh, injury to the spinal cord. With this brief introduction, I want to start uh, my uh, uh, conversations about pathology of transfer myelitis. Transfer myelitis has been known for, for years. In the, mid, uh, in, in the 18th century, the French uh, anatomists and pathologists described many cases of a spinal cord injury. And this is a beautiful drawing of one pathologist called Cruvelier, who in uh, 1836 published a very nice atlas of uh, a brain and a spinal cord pathology, and he already pointed out the presence of a lot of spinal cord disorders. But in terms of TM, the major investigation about TM began uh, 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 in, in the 20th century, early in the 20th century, and this should be 1882. And basically, it started in England when many of the neurologists uh, uh, explore what was going on with many patients that were having problems with uh, lower extremity weakness or acute onset of uh, paralysis. And they introduced the term softening of the spinal cord. And many of them were discussing if the softening of the spinal cord was due to a vascular problem, problems with the blood vessels, or was due to inflammation. So yesterday, somebody asked what means necrosis. Well, necrosis is the, the result of a tissue damage. When we have a stroke, we are going to have necrosis because we cut the blood supply to the spinal cord or the brain, and obviously that tissue is going to die. So we use two terms, and these two terms are very important in transfer myelitis. The first term is inflammation. What means inflammation? Inflammation is just the reaction, the tissue reaction against some type of injury. And that tissue reaction is mediated by inflammatory cells, blood, uh, white blood cells that migrate to the spinal cord and produce some type of injury. And that is a very important concept because many of the problems associated with transmit myelitis are direct, direct consequence of uh, this type of uh, tissue response. Necrosis is the result of different events. Necrosis may be the result of a trauma. Necrosis uh, may be the result of an infarction of the spinal cord. 
Or necrosis also may be the result of a long-standing proce uh, uh, process of inflammation. So the end point of the tissue is dead of the tissue, and that is when we refer to necrosis. Now, we heard yesterday about the differential diagnosis of transverse myelitis, and I don't want to uh, go again and describe the different uh, uh, etiological factors, but I would like to describe some of the uh, pathological observations that uh, we have about all of those uh, factors that contribute to transverse myelitis. Uh, in the past 10 years, um, we reviewed the autopsy collection at John Hopkins Hospitals. In the past 10 years, uh, we have collected at least uh, nine autopsies of patients that die after transfer myelitis. Um, I will discuss some of these uh, cases later, but what I want to point out is there is a, a, a quite clear heterogeneity in, 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 in the etiological factors in transfer myelitis. Uh, in the last two years with the transfer myelitis center, uh, we have had patients that came here that incidentally had uh, biopsies during the acute uh, stage of myelitis, and I would li like to show you some of those uh, findings. Let me talk to you about infection disorders, and it's very important to talk about infections because the viral infections are always uh, 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 mentioned as a theological factor in transfer myelitis. One thing that is quite important is there are two types of effects of viral infections. Effect number one is when the virus can invade cells in the nervous system, and particularly neurons. That's the case of disorders like polio or rabies, and this is an example of rabies. Rabies is already gone in the United States. There are very few cases, but in other countries in, in South America and in other uh, countries in Africa, uh, rabies is still a major health problem. And rabies is a virus that produces uh, a, a direct invasion of the motor neuron and produces damage and destruction of the motor neuron. The other type of viral uh, uh, effect is what happens when there is an infection, a viral infection, but there is no direct infection of the cells, but that infection is triggering an inflammatory reaction. And I think that that happens more often. We have a case of uh, Epstein-Barr viruses or varicella zoster viruses. Those are viruses that produce, rather than producing a direct invasion of uh, neurons, produce an immunological reaction that is the cause of, of the transverse myelitis or is the cause of the injury to the spinal cord. There are other types of diseases, and let me talk about a viral infection that is um, producing a lot of concerns. Uh, HIV doesn't produce a direct infection of the spinal cord. What is infected in, this, in, in HIV is uh, the immune cells like monocytes and macrophages and T cells. In the early stage of, uh, of, of the uh, health problems with HIV, there was um, some evidence that some of those patients uh, had problems with transfer myelitis. We had the opportunity to study one of those patients here, and this uh, patient was a, a drug abuser, used heroin, and it's likely that this patient may have two risk factors for transfer myelitis. One is the heroin, and the other one is the uh, HIV infection. What I want to point out here in this material is that the infection or the use of heroin induce a significant immunological reaction against the spinal cord. Uh, here we have a spinal cord that is stained with a special histological technique to show uh, the white matter. So this is called a myelin stain, and the myelin is going to stain blue, and the pale areas are areas that uh, lost myelin. The gray matter obviously doesn't have too much uh, white matter, so for that reason it's pale. But this patient had extensive uh, process of damage of the white matter, and what we found was that in addition to the loss of white matter, that w there was a very significant increase 
of the activity of macrophages in, uh, in the spinal cord. What are the macrophages and what is the role of macrophages? Macrophages are uh, immune cells that are basically surveying, are, are traveling around the body and are detecting uh, areas uh, of uh, infection and they remove debris or they remove uh, uh, injured tissue. But we know also that macrophages can produce injury and I think that that's the, the, the best explanation for this patient in which we found that the macrophages were producing a, a very severe attack against the uh, myelin and against the axon. Other type of infections uh, different to vital infections include bacterial and fungal infections. I don't want to go again to describe the different infections, but I want to point out that there are very severe uh, infections like uh, uh, spinal cord abscesses, like in this uh, uh, unfortunate patient that have a very fulminant form of transverse myelitis, uh, and, and this was found to be associated with uh, uh, a spinal cord abscess. When there is infection, and this is a concept that I want that uh, you take uh, 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 carefully. When there is infection, there are two types of tissue reactions. One reaction is inflammation, and the other one is the vascular reaction. And these two types of reactions eventually are going to produce the uh, tissue injury and are going to determine the magnitude of that injury. Inflammation, as I, I said before, is the result of infiltration uh, of the spinal cord by inflammatory cells like lymphocytes or macrophages. And the vascular reaction is just the uh, effect that some of these infections or inflammation produce in the blood vessels. And eventually in many of these cases there are also ischemic changes or loss of blood supply to the area of injury. There are different type of infections, bacterial infections. This is a patient who was seen here in the transfer myelitis center, was a 67-year-old uh, uh, patient who had the typical onset of transfer myelitis, back pain, acute paraparesis, and the spinal fluid showed some uh, degree of pleocytosis. What it was found later was that this patient had uh, infection by a Lyme, uh, by a Borrelia that uh, li uh, produce uh, a significant damage of the central portion of the spinal cord as is seen here. What about parasitic diseases? Uh, uh, Dr. Mandler mentioned yesterday that in some areas of the United States, particularly in the south, in areas uh, near to Mexico, the cysticercosis is a potential problem. And this is an image of cysticercosis. Cysticercosis is a parasite that uh, patients can get after they eat uh, some vegetables that are not very well cooked. And the ova of the, of the parasite can go to different areas of the body, including the spinal cord, and invade the spinal cord and produce significant inflammatory reaction and also produce a significant mass effect, obviously producing the picture of a transfer myelitis. In other countries, like in Asia, schistosomiasis is really a, a public health problem. It's a, it's Fortunately, no uh, uh, major issue in the United States. What about other type of reactions to infections? And I will spend a little bit of time here because we think that uh, a, a very important percentage of patients with transfer myelitis are going to experience this type of situation. What is the meaning of post-infectious myelitis? The meaning of that is that a patient gets some type of viral infection or bacterial infection, and later one of the speakers this morning is going to spend more time explaining about bacterial infections. Some of these patients uh, have delayed immune responses that attack the spinal cord, and these delayed immune responses are mediated by uh, cellular responses, by lymphocytes, or are mediated by humanal responses like immunoglobulins that produce a significant attack against the spinal cord. And as we mentioned before, this is going to result in a tissue injury in a vascular response that eventually is going to produce a different type of pathology in the spinal cord, including destruction of myelin and uh, tissue necrosis. I introduce this term here. It's called vasculomyelinopathy. It's a 
a term that was introduced in the 60s by a neurologist called Charles Poser, who did extensive evaluation of patients with uh, transverse myelitis and multiple sclerosis and other immunological problems in the nervous system. And he suggests that many of these disorders are mediated by um, vascular responses, immunological responses against blood vessels that produce extensive damage of the myelin. And let me show you this, this uh, 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 histological analysis. This is coming from a, uh, a girl who was 12 years old and had the acute onset of back pain and leg weakness. Uh, she had a history of chicken pox uh, two weeks before the onset of the symptoms. And unfortunately, she died 48 hours after the onset of the symptoms because this was a very fulminant disease. This was a very aggressive and there was no chance to treat this patient. When she arrived to the emergency department at Hopkins, she was already in respiratory arrest. When we did the necropsy, we found that all the spinal cord, and this is again one uh, myelin stain, it's a, a, a myelin is blue, and in a normal spinal cord, everything here should be blue, but you can see that there are some holes here, and that represents areas of what we call demyelination or perivascular demyelination. And you can see clearly in this cross-section of the spinal cord that there was extensive damage of the white matter, but also there was extensive damage of the gray matter as well. You can see here an area of inflammation. And this is one image that probably you are going to see a little bit later because this is a typical image of inflammation in the spinal cord and represent the accumulation of many inflammatory cells around blood vessels. These are blood vessels, and all of these dark spots represent uh, lymphocytes, macrophages, or inflammatory cells. Well, the conclusion of, after analyzing this case is in, in this unfortunate patient, there was a significant uh, uh, damage of uh, white matter structure and gray matter structure and probably mediated by the autoimmune response that probably was the result of a, of a post-infectious uh, uh, myelitis. And again, this is likely to be mediated by uh, cellular responses as well as in uh, humoral responses and is a devastating disorder if uh, it's not catch at the right time. Let's move a little bit to other topic. And I, I, I think that the topic of uh, vascular pathology in the spinal cord is important because not everything is inflammation in transverse myelitis. There are many patients that probably had rather than inflammation had probably uh, some type of vascular event, some type of thrombosis in one artery of the spinal cord or thrombosis in a venous system of the spinal cord that produce the significant uh, damage in the spinal cord. I would like to remember, uh, re recall a, a little bit of the anatomy. Uh, this is the aura, is the major blood vessel coming out of, uh, of the heart. And you can see that Basically, there are different blood supplies for uh, the spinal cord. Uh, one is coming from the anterior spinal artery, and the other is coming from an uh, 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 artery that is um, um, uh, from the aura, is called an kiwis artery, and these two arteries are the major supplies of, this, uh, of the uh, spinal cord. And these uh, arteries uh, are going to uh, provide a, a vascular supply to the most anterior region of the spinal cord. So if there is a, a obstruction, occlusion of one of these arteries, obviously the consequence is going to be an infarction of the most anterior area of the spinal cord, and that is going to produce paralysis because the anterior horn is going to be affected and many of the motor neurons are going to die. There are many uh, pathologies associated with vascular myelopathies, and I described some of those pathologies here. I mentioned the arterial infarctions as a consequence of obstruction of these arteries, but other problems may be involved in uh, the venous system, and this is an area that is very important for neurologists now, because now we are seeing more and more uh, 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 patients with uh, venous thrombosis and more evidence of uh, of venous pathology as a result of uh, uh, improvement of uh, radiological testing. There is uh, new concerns about uh, uh, 
embolic uh, processes or problems associated with uh, uh, nucleus pulposus embolism to uh, arterial or venous system in, in the spinal cord that obviously are going to produce devastating uh, uh, necrosis or damage of the spinal cord. This is an example of anterior spinal artery infarction. All of this area was damaged and the neurons are basically very bad, in very bad shape, are necrotic. This is an example and this is a diagram from uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Hughes who uh, was is a pathologist from England who has spent uh, many years studying the pathology of the spinal cord and he did a very nice description of what happened in venous thrombosis and what is the distribution of the venous thrombosis pathology because the pathology of, of this uh, condition is quite different to the arterial obstruction. It's predominantly a central core disease and obviously it's going to produce uh, devastating changes in the areas of the gray matter and uh, many times in the white matter as well. Uh, we had the opportunity to evaluate a patient that we believe had a problem with venous thrombosis associated with antiphospholipid syndrome and this is the MRI. You can see the abnormality in the uh, uh, MRI here, the signal intensity change and you can see the axial uh, image that shows some uh, areas of central core abnormality and lateral core abnormality. And this patient, the main, the main risk factor was a very increased level of anticardiolipine antibodies. And in this patient there was uh, a demonstration of uh, uh, no evidence of uh, cellularity or pleocytosis. And we believe that this patient had some type of venous thrombosis in the spinal cord. Um, other type of vascular pathology uh, that sometimes is very concerning is the presence of uh, arteriovenous malformations. Uh, uh, these arteriovenous malformations are frequently in the uh, external portion of the spinal cord. But the presence of these arteriovenous malformation produce chronic stages of uh, venous uh, ischemia and can produce also arterial damage and um, this is obviously going to produce uh, a significant ischemic damage of the spinal cord if the arteriovenous malformation is not corrected uh, 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 in a good time. Let's move uh, to other topic that was mentioned yesterday. So we already reviewed the infectious pathology, the post-infectious pathology, we review uh, the vascular pathology, and let's talk a little bit about other conditions that were mentioned yesterday. We had the opportunity to evaluate two uh, autopsies from two patients uh, uh, with uh, the VEX. And I would like to show you some of the uh, pathological findings. This was a patient, a 61-year-old patient who had history of optic neuritis and recurrent myelitis. And as you can see here, again, this is a myelin stain, so you are becoming an expert in uh, uh, histology, everything that is blue is myelin, everything that is pink is bad or is uh, unstained for myelin. So this is the spinal cord of this patient. You can see a, a, a very extensive uh, area of cavitation in the spinal cord. Uh, some of the segments of the spinal cord were uh, preserved, but anyway some of the white matter tracts were affected. And obviously as a uh, criteria uh, uh, to establish the diagnosis of the VIC disease, this patient had a history of optic neuritis and this is the optic chiasm that is basically an anatomical structure where the two optic nerves uh, get together. And you can see that the normal myelin is here but this area of the chiasm is, is, is devoid of uh, myelin. That means that the myelin was lost. Uh, uh, because the uh, uh, process producing this type of pathology. What we found in the spinal cord uh, has been reported before by other researchers and uh, Jester was mentioned here as well. Um, Dr. Katz mentioned uh, briefly uh, that in some of these patients, uh, in addition to the extensive necrosis, there is also a, a quite curious proliferation of the blood vessels. This may point out that the initial event may be of a nature, of the ischemic nature. We are not sure about that and probably we need to have more uh, uh, analysis of uh, uh, spinal cords to see if this finding is consistent. But it's very interesting to see that in, in, in those patients with uh, the VIX and in our two patients, there was always proliferation of uh, uh, blood vessels in areas of injury. 
Occasionally we found uh, evidence of some inflammation, but that was not necessarily uh, impressive. Of and that point out that in some way uh, there are some uh, um, inflammatory uh, uh, factors involved in the presence of this disorder. This is a longitudinal section of the optic nerve with a myelin stain showing a, uh, showing a normal area of a myelin stain and a very abnormal area. And this is to show you that this is different to multiple sclerosis. In multiple sclerosis, you lose the myelin, but the fibers of the optic nerve are preserved. The axon are relatively preserved. In the patient that we studied with the VX, there was extensive loss. This is a silver stain uh, that we use to identify fibers, and there is a significant loss of uh, fibers in some areas of the optic nerve and chiasm. That suggests that in some way this may be a little bit different to multiple sclerosis because there is a significant loss of uh, optic nerve axons. Um, let's move to uh, other type of uh, 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 pathological condition. This is uh, one of our patients that fortunately uh, is alive and he is doing uh, relatively well. This patient had an acute onset of transverse myelitis, but during the evaluation of transverse myelitis, it was found that in addition to the spinal cord damage, there was evidence of, uh, probably it's not very well seen here, but there was evidence of a very diffuse leptomeningeal enhancement. And the spinal cord had a very central uh, uh, lesion in the lumbar region. So we were uh, I mean, we, we were in, uh, in a difficult position to identify what was the problem in this patient, and the only way to try to identify what was the cause of this problem was doing a, a, a biopsy, not necessarily of the spinal cord, but the, the covering of the spinal cord. And what we found was that there was evidence of what we call arachnoiditis, and in this particular patient there was evidence of a granulomatose arachnoiditis. When we have this type of cells that are called uh, 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 multinucleated, multinucleated uh, giant cells, uh, we always think about an infectious condition is called tuberculosis. But in this patient, we didn't find tuberculosis, we didn't find sarcoidosis. And this is likely the result of an immunological entity that is uh, very rare and uh, is producing a chronic uh, uh, arachnoiditis and uh, eventually that was one of the uh, 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 important factors for the presence of transfer myelitis. Uh, occasionally, tumors can produce a picture of transfer myelitis, and this is uh, an example of, of, of this situation. This uh, 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 patient had a cervical myelopathy that initially was identified as transfer myelitis, but later, after uh, different studies, uh, that include uh, 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 frequent MRIs, we found that there was uh, evidence of more lesions in the cerebellum, and later we established that this patient had a lymphoma. So lymphoma of the, of the central core are, rel are very rare, and, and, and in this particular patient, the lymphoma uh, occupied basically the entire portion of the cervical uh, cord. But one uh, uh, pathological phenomenon that we observe here is that the lower segments of the spinal cord had something that we saw before, that is the central cord necrosis, likely associated with thrombosis of the uh, venous system as a result of the, uh, uh, of the tumor. Uh, I would like to finish here uh, with a, a very fortunately patient who had transverse myelitis uh, more than two years ago. Uh, she is one of my patients, and she went to uh, be evaluated almost 24 hours after the onset of, of the transfer myelitis. And, uh, her doctor was very quick and did a very quick uh, radiological evaluation, and they found evidence of this large lesion in the cervical cord. And if you put a little bit of attention in the cross section in the axial images here, this is a, a, a T2 sequence, and this is the spinal cord, and this uh, bright area is the area of lesion, and this is the area, uh, th this is the axial uh, T1 with uh, contrast or post contrast, and you can see that this lesion had a significant enhancement. Well, this patient uh, uh, was evaluated uh, quickly, and uh, uh, the neuro neurosurgeon uh, went and took a biopsy 
thinking that this was a brain, this was a spinal cord tumor. And I think that uh, in some way was a, 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 a fair thinking because this was a quite enhancing lesion and that is very, uh, that is frequently seen in patients with spinal cord tumors. Anyway, the, the result of this biopsy is, is quite interesting because this show basically what happened in the first week in transverse myelitis and it's a very extensive inflammatory response and this is a portion of the posterior horns of the spinal cord of this patient and the, there was a, a, a very uh, uh, extensive infiltration by inflammatory cells particularly by uh, lymphocytes and macrophages. Uh, fortunately the, the patient is walking and she's having some problems with pain but this patient is doing very well despite the extensive lesion that she had at the beginning. The patient was later treated with IV uh, methylprednisolone and probably that contributed in some way to the improvement of her condition. Now I want to conclude my presentation with the view from neuropathology about transfer myelitis is we may have a perspective from the clinical side and we always have the differential diagnosis, we always think about acute transverse myelitis, subacute, chronic. But I want to give you the, the, the view of a, 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 a neuropathology so you can have a better understanding of what may happen in the spinal cord. Uh, I will use the term myelopathy. I, I will avoid using the term myelitis. Myelitis in pathology means uh, inflammation, but not everything that is related with, with uh, a spinal cord my, or, or myelopathy means inflammation. For that reason, I use the term myelopathy, and I will say that in transverse myelitis, you, we may have two major areas of, of concerns. One is if there is an ischemic myelopathy, or two, if there is an inflammatory myelopathy. If there is ischemic myelopathy, we need to determine if this is a hemorrhagic myelopathy or is ischemic myelopathy. And the etiology of these uh, uh, two conditions may be a little bit uh, uh, different or may be related. Uh, the most frequent cause of ischemic myelopathy is arterial thrombosis, but also venous thrombosis can produce this type of uh, injury. Uh, AVMs, arteriovenous malformations, uh, can produce hemorrhagic uh, uh, lesions, but also can produce some hemodynamic changes in the spinal cord that can lead to the presence of ischemic myelopathy. And that is frequently seen in patients with AVMs. Now, what is the other side of the coin? The other side of the coin is inflammatory myelopathy, and this is the area that we need to invest more time and we need to invest more research because I think that that is the area where we can potentially improve and uh, intervene in the improvement of patients. Inflammatory myopathies may be associated with two types of conditions, infections, and we already mentioned viral infections, bacterial infections, parasitic infections, or autoimmune myelopathies. And these autoimmune myelopathies will include the myelopathies that are associated uh, with vaccinations, myelopathies that are associated with post-infectious processes, and myelopathies that are associated with other type of autoimmune disorders like lupus or some type of rheumatological disorder like Sjogren's disease. So I think that in terms of pathological approaches, this is a fair approach to classify the different type of, of, of uh, uh, pathological conditions that affect the spinal cord. I think that I am just time, and I don't know if I have time for questions. Dr. Kerr? Oh, sure. Okay. Mm, I don't remember. Many patients with lumbar uh, 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 lesions may experience that type of symptom. Did everybody hear the, question, the, the comment? Or yes. Everybody got it even in the back? Okay. I feel really strong about this thing. Yeah. Uh, that issue is quite important, and uh, I think Dr. Kerr also emphasized on that issue yesterday, is vaccines are very helpful. Vaccines are very useful. Unfortunately, occasionally we have some unfortunately situations like myelitis. That, 
I don't think, unfortunately, we, we don't have epidemiological studies in transverse myelitis, and that is one of the areas that uh, we are trying to investigate with the database that we are generating, because there is no data. There is a recent study, for example, evaluating, evaluating uh, hepatitis uh, vaccines and multiple sclerosis. That's a different issue. But vaccination in multiple sclerosis was also similar to transverse myelitis. And the two recent uh, uh, studies point out that there is not necessarily a direct relationship, or at least there is no, uh, uh, it, there is no cause of concern. A, a, a topic that was mentioned yesterday by Dr. Irani and other speakers is everybody has an immuno immunological identity and immunological background, and that is different in everybody. And we know that the immune system can respond in different ways, and that is determined by your genetic background. It's very likely that the patients that are having reactions uh, uh, after vaccinations have uh, uh, some type of determinant that uh, make them sensitive to this type of vaccination. And the same will happen with, with other vital infections. The same will happen with uh, varicella zoster. And I think that is the same type of, of situation. And I hope that at the end of this morning, with the, some of the speakers that are talking about the immunological uh, uh, factors in uh, a spinal cord injury, we can clarify a little bit uh, more about that. So do people feel like we need to talk about this more? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so then we will. So uh, we're going to do something with this scale about this. Sounds like this is a big issue. And uh, I want to get your feedback. There, Mr. Chairman, dear attendance, indeed it's a great honor for